Um, okay, well, this is some uh, the sort of panel that you don't normally see at a music business event. Most people are still pretty much hung up in wringing some cash out of the film or advertising world. Um, people haven't really um, started to think too much about how they could be working with an industry that's particularly important to Scotland, but also to Iceland, uh, which is where Anna's from. And although we'd like to have had a few more panelists on it, it seems that there's still a bit to go before I've convinced uh, people in the tourism sector that this is a, this is a good idea. So um, as you'd have heard from, from uh, Simon in the last panel um, with the hotel sector, that tends to be pretty much across the board. But nevertheless, the idea is to come up with some ideas and hopefully some solutions as to how the, the music and the tourism businesses can work more closely and actually cooperate better than they are at the moment. That's not to say there's not some things happening, but they could be happening more. So I think we'll start with Les on my far left here. And if you could introduce yourself, Les, and explain a little bit about what, you, what you're doing. Uh, OK, thanks. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Les Kidger. Um, I'm a director of a company called CK Events. Uh, we predominantly are a promoter. Um, as you all know, promoters are the the bane of the industry, uh, so I'm told every time I speak. But um, we book the bands, we put the stage in, we put the lights, we put the sound in, and hopefully at the end of it, people come and buy tickets, and uh, we do the risk part of it as well. Um, CK is a Scottish-based company. Uh, we're independent, uh, and we tend to specialise in outdoor events. Um, we have worked in a lot of uh, tourist related venues, um, castles, stately homes uh, and stuff like that over the last uh, four or five years. My name is Audrey McLennan, I'm Senior Tourism Manager at Highlands and Islands Enterprise who is a Scottish Government Agency for promoting sustainable economic growth throughout the Highlands and Islands, north and west of Scotland. Um, I work myself in the tourism team and our task is to sort of grow tourism revenues and unlock some of that potential, encourage um, the industry to work better together and see where we can intervene to help make that happen, either faster or... But my name is Anna Hildur, Hildebrandsdóttir. Uh, I am a programme director for Nordic Music Export, which is an initiative owned by the five export offices in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland and Iceland. I started my job 1st of February um, and we are already starting discussions with travel companies on how we can work together, uh, mainly airlines to start with, but I'm, I've already made contact with Simon now who had a hugely inspiring um, sort of contribution here today and I was really blown away by the ideas and vision that he has. But prior to that I run Iceland Music Export and uh, we took over the Iceland Airways Festival a couple of years ago and we worked a lot uh, mainly on creating a dialogue with both governmental bodies and the tourist industry in Iceland uh, by mapping the festivals that are there and trying to get them to look at how the creative people are doing things and to lift that um, rather than always just thinking from the point of view that they want to create something new but really take what's there and appreciate the initiatives that are going on everywhere in their unique form and often in niche forms and try and sort of see the value in working together on that. Audrey, I think it's good to start with you. You've, you've said that you're there to develop uh, sustainable businesses in the Highlands and Islands in the, in the tourism sector. Do you find that there's a focus on particular areas of tourism? Are our priorities set or is it a matter of someone coming to you and suggesting that something might be worth exploring? Well, it, it, it happens in a number of ways, but right, right across the whole patch, 
right across the region and the islands, there's, there are area teams that are actually close to the business community, which in many cases, tourism really can be up to 30% of employment in some cases. And the, the teams there will proactively sort of seek out every day. The, the networks are quite close and people know each other. So in some cases, it will be reactive where someone's come along with an idea and there'll be someone in our office who can chat that through with them, scope it out, understand what their aspirations are, and then uh, we'll see where that takes them, but ultimately actually help make it happen. And in other cases, it, it can be quite proactive. Um, I mean, uh, one of our biggest projects, a capital investment project, just now is up in John O'Groats. Now, um, I'd be surprised if anyone in the audience has not um, heard of John O'Groats before and um, some of the press over the last sort of 10 years has not always been positive but th there, is, there, there are things happening there and the regeneration of that area is, is really positive and that was proactive. And do you focus on a particular part of that? I mean, is the, is the focus because it's, um, it's the northerly most tip of the mainland, is that what you use to to sell it or what, what particular areas or what particular subjects are used to, to promote destinations or tourism we, businesses? We, Islands Lands Enterprise aren't actually tasked with uh, promoting right. destinations or tourism anywhere. That would be um, for Visit Scotland. That's their, their uh, core role in their bread and but the, the actual businesses, if you're helping businesses up there, I mean, what we'll, sort of we'll, we'll do We'll sit then? down with the business and understand how their, their routes to market, how they want to reach them, and what help they need in order to do that really effectively. I mean, one of the, the biggest projects that we're probably involved in in terms of, sort of tourism is actually getting mar good market intelligence into the hearts and minds of the businesses and helping them to understand what market opportunities are out there. Tourism Intelligence Scotland is a, a joint partnership project between Visit Scotland, Scottish Enterprise and HIE. Scottish Enterprise lead this, but it's actually combining all the research that we do and getting it into a much more readable format that we can take out to the industry so that it's actually easy to understand. And it's, it's hugely valued by them. And LinkedIn, I, I guess there's about 600 people sign up to that and start discussions from the industry itself, including the music industry, Olaf. Yeah, well, I joined after your recommendation, it's very good. <laughs> and, and the guides are hugely valued. I mean, there's the events and festival guide, which will be out um, quite soon. And that will be of particular interest to the audience here today. Les, you've run a lot of events since you started, a lot of big events in an area that you wouldn't really associate with stadium concerts. And I think the, not just that, it's the fact that you've, you've also run gigs in Codder Castle and Hopeton House, which is, is not really the first place that you'd, you'd think of going to see a boy band. Um, in terms of what you're, who you're bringing in, who, who's coming to those shows and what kind of, um, economic impact I suppose it's having um, what would you how to what extent are you bringing people into into plays and to what extent are they actually coming from um, the actual area uh, surrounding area yeah I mean it, a lot of it depends on the the venue and the area one of the things we found and you know um, we're based in Inverness as well um, although we uh, cover Scotland Edinburgh Glasgow Aberdeen or wherever what we found when we, we were looking in the market is that certainly from where we were up in, up in Inverness, if we wanted to go and see a gig or a, a concert, we had to travel to Glasgow, travel to Edinburgh, travel to Aberdeen. So it's not just £42 for a ticket or 30 quid for a ticket. It was a night's accommodation. It was the travel, et cetera, et cetera. So a night out for, you know, for me to go to a gig in Glasgow was probably three 400 quid. Um, we looked at that concept and thought, well, hold on a second. If, if we can take, for example, Westlife to Corda. Now, Corda Castle is nine miles outside of Inverness. Uh, it's a beautiful castle, has a massive tourism industry there, but they need extra income, like any uh, tourism venue does. Um, we sold them the idea 
and we sold the artist the idea that instead of you know 12,000 people from the Highlands heading to to Glasgow Edinburgh why not reverse the, the trend um, and very successfully on that show um, they flew in you know and um, sometimes it's difficult explaining to a, a, an artist manager that you know you're, you're 10 minutes past Glasgow on a plane you know the, it's the same length of time out of London or out of Dublin or, or wherever they're coming to um, so once we got the concept past the artist we just had to get the um, the public to buy into it and then obviously it opened up a brand new market of people who wouldn't travel to concerts you know and um, the likes of once again Corda with a lot of people in, in, in the Highland area who'd probably never been to a show before it had its downsides they didn't realize you had to sit in a traffic jam for two hours and stuff like that but on the upside they, they, they turn out in their thousands and, and you know certainly in the areas we're taking them to and you know Hopeton House as well um, which is a little bit different. I mean, Hopeton House is a, uh, an absolute stunning venue. Um, and the one thing that attracted us to Hopeton House was uh, Lord Hopeton said, you can put the stage in front of my house. And that sells itself. You know, normally you've got to put them t a wee bit away from the house and stuff like that. So, but a lot of these artists want to do it. And subsequently, the, you know, the public like to see something rather than go into a, a tin box, be it a, you know, a MEC, NEC or a Wembley Arena or something. And in terms of what it does for the for local tourism um, or hospitality businesses, are you aware of any immediate advantages for them? I mean, are people coming from far away and staying in hotels and things? Because one thing that I've noticed with, say, something like Rock Ness is that you've got a few hotels filled with artists, but there's not really anyone. Um, you can still get a and b really easily. So yeah. people are either camping, spending all their money within the site, and then going yeah. home. But no one's really going out in Inverness in the evening. And no. Rock I there. mean, it's not Rock Ness. I mean, festivals are a little bit different. You know, festivals, people go along to a festival, they put a tent, if they can take drink in with them, they'll take the drink in with them, they'll take some food in with them, and they'll go in and they'll spend a weekend there. You know, when you're in a festival, you're in, the doors are closed, and you're not getting back out again. We do a series in uh, Inverness called Summer in the City. Um, now, this this year, we're doing a four-night Summer in the City where we have four uh, different artists coming. Um, on the We've got JLS coming, um, who look after the younger market. We have Status Quo coming, um, on the Saturday night where we've got Run Rig and on the Sunday we've got Jules Holland. So we're kind of appealing to a bigger uh, and a wider audience. We'll have an ex excess of 20,000 people in our venue, which is Northern Meeting Park, which is in the city centre. Um, it's an enclosed green grass area. It's a bit of grass enclosed within the city centre. Those people uh, will either live in the region. The chances are, because they're so close to the city centre and the Northern Mean Park is 100 metres from the city centre, they will eat in the city, they will drink in the city. Our secondary spends, which are so important to us, which is like bars and catering, are very low at that venue because you can literally be sitting in a restaurant and 10 minutes later be inside the venue. However, for the city itself, for the hotels and the bed and breakfast and the restaurants and all that kind of stuff, it's a massive business to them. Um, last year... Uh, it sounds as though we only do boy bands. Last year we put Boy Zone on there, another Irish boy band, and the local McDonald's that's been there for the last 16 years had its busiest trading day ever. So obviously Boy Zone fans like McDonald's. Um, whether or not that's true, I don't know. But um, you know, I once heard a, a you know a, a publican say to me after the Westlife concert uh, that I'll never have to buy a drink again in Inverness. Well, that wasn't quite true. I still have to buy the drink, but the, the, <laughs> they are, memories, yeah, eh? I know they do, yeah, but they are setting themselves up. In terms of tourism data, um, it, it, it's quite an interesting fact. I mean, you know, we get figures thrown at us that that weekend will generate two million to the economy plus and all the rest of it. If we take Runrig, which is a, you know, uh, a, a fantastic Scottish Celtic rock band, um, we have their ticketing data and, you know, that, that show in itself is 130 tickets from a sellout now, which is great for us, we're happy about it. In terms of the postal code data we have, 30% of the tickets sold are in a 25 mile radius of Inverness. 70% are outside of a 25 mile radius of Inverness. Right, this is That's great. a massive, 
Now, normally it's a 70-30, mm. but in the case of this artist, you know, um, you know, I, could, I could, should have probably thought the data, you know, the, the Outer Hebrides will be empty. So if you want to rob a house, go to the Outer Hebrides that weekend. Uh, Lindo in South Wales has got the most, biggest run rig fan base in the world because they're all coming. So the hotels, the bed and breakfast are going to make a killing that weekend. Now, this really interests me because I think that these economic impact surveys are quite quite controversial. I mean, I posted something on the Tourism Intelligence uh, LinkedIn a couple of days ago, and someone quite rightly said, well, would they have spent the money elsewhere? Would they have, you know, would they have gone out anyway, etc.? But the, what you can't argue with is thousands of people from outside a 25-mile radius coming in uh, Inverness. And how seriously is that taken in the local tourism sector? I mean, do you find that people are approaching you to say, well, how can we actually make more of this? How can we work with you? If you've got these people coming in, how can we get them to come to our restaurants? How can we maybe convince them to stay for an extra couple of days and make a, make a short break out of it? Is that, has anyone actually come to you in that respect? Yes and no. There's two, there's two elements to it. I think the first element is we're working a, a lot closer, certainly in Inverness, with the, uh, the business organisations, uh, the public organisations and stuff like that, to be able to uh, grasp the concept. I mean, one of the problems I had last year was uh, the day after the show, a couple of us go along to one of the local riverside restaurants to have a bar restaurant to have a, a, a wee drink and, 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 a, and a bit of lunch on the Sunday on the, after the Saturday night. And this, is, this, this bar restaurant was in the direct walking path of the city centre, the train station, the bus station, the taxi rank. So he knew 8,000 people were going to pass his door that night. He ran out of drink at 10 o'clock. And we sat down with them this year and said, this can't happen again. Because the problem I've got is if someone for this audience comes to Inverness for the weekend and comes to see a concert because they want to see Run Rig, and they can't get a meal and they can't get a drink, and the biggest problem we have is the hotel rates go tenfold, which is one of the biggest problems I have in Inverness when we put a show on, um, they're not going to come back next year. And I need them to come back next year to see whoever we're putting on. So in some concepts, yes, it's being... It's been attracted, and it, we are addressing it. On the no side, and I think Audrey will probably agree with you on this, hoteliers. Do never, when, when we book hotels for artists, we call ourselves Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, or anything. If we mention the word CK, 500% This bill. is very interesting because um, I have, I'd need to substantiate this, but... It's interesting that the Fence Collective aren't doing the home game in Anstrada this year, um, which is their own town, and they've moved they've moved the, their annual spring music event to St Andrews. And the impression I get is this was based on the fact that they were trying to bring in people to their own town to help the the local local hospitality trade, um, local hoteliers and B and Bs. And then they were finding that the rates were shooting up. And it's like, well, actually, we're doing it off season so that you can actually fill your places up. So don't be greedy. Um, I mean, how do you deal with this at Airwaves? I mean, it must be you've got a similar situation to what they have in Inverness. And you've, you've got limited hotel space. You've got thousands of people coming into town, often from abroad, to to attend an event. I mean, is this something that is planned or is it because when most people from abroad buy their package, they're buying the hotel with it anyway? Um, it's different. I think about 25% or 30% they stay in an alternative accommodation. People like you are now constantly coming there, so you know people that you can sort of stay with. But no, I still always get you to get me a hotel, <laughs> Anna. <yeah. laughs> But anyways, the, uh, um, I mean, since Airwave started, there's been a massive development in hotel buildings in Reykjavik. So there is enough availability, um, but the prices have gone up. And what's, what's peculiar for us is that Iceland Air, 
um, had for a couple of years asked us to move the festival back two weeks because now the season is getting longer and longer and we clashed with um, half-term holidays from Britain which we're taking off space on the planes and hotels so we actually eventually agreed to so the, for the first time now uh, Airways will not be the third weekend of, um, of uh, October but the first weekend of November and this is giving us much more favorable rates for everybody so we kind of it's an interesting experience for uh, to see whether that will put the figures up or or whether we will actually lose the the motto by by moving the festival but it's interesting because back in the days when i was a consultant for the airline and for the promoter that did the festival um, then in 2003 i actually suggested to the promoter who was always struggling with money get a 10 percent commission from the hotels and um, Nothing came off it then, and it would be like in your dreams now that the hotels would give anything back. They just up their prices, and it's really kind of hard to deal with them. The one thing that has happened, though, is that there has been a, this experience of Kex Hostel, that they're a new uh, hostel in Reykjavik, and they just really got the taste of how profitable it is for them to collaborate with Iceland Airways. So they they put up one of the uh, off-venue events. There's a huge off-venue program at Iceland Airways where you can almost see all the artists that play for free during the day in bookshops, or, yeah, bookstores and record stores. And, and this Kex hotel, hostel really picked up on it. And they just couldn't believe how profitable it was. Their bar was packed throughout the festival and they just made scrillions of uh, kronas on selling alcohol to the, all these people. So that was a really good um, experience and it's, it's kind of interesting. The things that we've been able to argue now to governmental bodies is like, look at how much we deliver in taxes from the 4 million euros that foreigners who come to airwaves spend during this one weekend where nobody used to come. Before. And I'd also like to underline that I, I know how you conducted this research. So rather than being being something you plucked out of the sky, you've actually made it, it made it um, the, I guess, the lowest figure that it could be. Mm. So, you know, again, just to, if people are thinking, oh, well, anyone can come up with a figure and, and make it like that, yeah. it is actually... No, we conducted a survey where we asked people, we asked 350 visitors from abroad how much they spent, where they stayed. We did quite a detailed research that we have translated into English, so if you want to use it, you're welcome to... And we actually found out that what we thought was that possibly these would be more kind of budget travelers than the average traveler. But we found out that uh, the guests that come to Airways, they spend on average what the average spend of tourists that come to Iceland do spend. And to the benefits of tourism, we are reaching a younger uh, population that everybody wants to at some point to kind of reinvent themselves. So, the majority, 80% of the people are 18 to 35 year olds that come there. But have just the connection with other ideas and whether tourist industry people sometimes um, approach you. One of the really, uh, has anybody been to Iceland Airways? Yes? Have you been to a Blue Lagoon party? <laughs> well, I don't know, for anybody that has gone there and anybody that has checked out Iceland Airways, the icon photo of the Iceland Airways Festival is from the Blue Lagoon party. It's this one of the coolest parties that you can go to with a really cool DJ and you hang out Maybe there. Maybe we should explain what it is. It's a geo, it's the, was it the byproduct of a geothermal it, electricity plant yeah. in a lava field? So you've got all this kind of strange silica sludge, and you're outside in a lava field with all this steam. And so you're it's sitting relaxed incredible. next to a power plant that could look like a nuclear plant, but it is actually an environmentally friendly uh, production of geothermal energy. And uh, right in the middle of a lava field, and this has been really developed as a tourist uh, destination. And now the Blue Lagoon uh, people have really picked up on how they can maximize 
the value for them of doing this and they often have the initiatives of coming with ideas on what to do, what to do around this and it's kind of and and it's been the coolest DJs in Iceland they have picked up on it as well so they perform there and it becomes an experience like nothing else where people hang out with white mud on their faces and now they've developed a bar in the middle of the kind of water so you can really hang out there and you can have massage if you like as well and listen to cool music. Do you find that there's other visitor attractions that have, have taken advantage of this, that you've got this influx of people <clears throat> and that they're not just taking advantage of it but they're maybe giving something back so they're perhaps saying well we recognize that Airwaves brings in your X amount of foreign visitors so we should sponsor it or we should work with them to to actually get them along to to our museum or our um, our tours because obviously the Blue Lagoon and Kex they're, they're two examples but are there any sort of specific specific visitor yeah, attractions are, like, that do um, it? The bus companies they have taken advantage of it and they now want to collaborate with Airbus because they want to um, advertise the services in the Airwaves um, newsletter and um, in, on the website. So they've offered Airwaves 15% commission of all the tours that they sell. So this <coughs> might be tours to uh, the Golden Circle or the Geyser area or something like that. So more and more the tourist industry has picked up on this, but it's taken some few years. I think this is, uh, this is an interesting point because I, you know, if you take Belladrum, they did a survey of 19 UK festivals in 2010, I think it was, and Belladrum had the highest spend outside the festival site of any of these 19 festivals across the UK. So that says a the you know people with a it's a, maybe a different type of festival goer that's that's heading up to Belladrum, but Quite family orientated exactly yeah. and it's what interests me is that if you've got these people with quite a bit of cash um coming up to coming up to the highlands what's is anyone are you aware of anyone that's that's kind of trying to uh, engage with those with those customers I, I, I think right well right across the highlands and islands there's there's groups that are there together to make their destination more successful now whether that be in and in, in the one i know of around inverness's destination loch ness that collaborates quite a bit with inverness and um there's the Outer Hebrides Tourism Industry Action Group, but they're all led by an industry person, not always a hotelier. There's quite often visitor attractions around that, people who are putting on festivals. And I guess the minute you sort of start speaking to people, you know, good things can happen. And I think you've got to hear it from both sides of the fence. I mean, the basics of supply and demand, it's not just um, prices won't go up in hotels just because... If it's a large conference it's on, if there's any, any sort of spike in demand whatsoever, then it happens all the world over that the prices of course, get elevated. Yeah. But there, there, are, there are great examples. I mean, I guess I, I, I see some gaps. I don't see it. Um, it's actually easy to buy a, a package where music and the general sort of core services of tourism have been bundled together. So you've, you might have your food and drink and a a day out somewhere, whether it be in the, from Inverness to Kyle in the train or things that have been packaged together. But I actually am not aware of any, any hotelier or other tourist attraction for that matter that is actually packaging something together. I mean, I, I there is, I mean, there's... Rod Stewart. Outside mm, and yeah, I mean, that, that was, yeah, I mean, certainly for, for the Highlands, that was a, a, a totally different case. But I think, you know, the, the, there is companies out there like, Super break, who you know, company been on in a long time, and yeah. if there's massive, if there's a large concert happening, they will package hotel ticket and um, accommodation together, and obviously, in the in the case of super break, they'll have prearranged rates for years in advance. So yeah. you know, the the hotelier con or whoever can you know do that. Are but, they doing this for concerts? Though? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you, any concert, any main concert in the UK. Um, and, and well, Madonna's playing here this summer in, in Edinburgh. Super Break have packages available. So, um, and there is, the, you know, the, the you know we deal um, our the hotel we deal with for our artists. They do packages with us, 
uh, where we sell them the tickets and, and and they obviously bring you know the general public to it as well but you know it's a, you know music's a, a great thing for adding added value and you know Belladrum's one of the great examples where you can take your kids for free to a festival and because you can do that they've created a, a an atmosphere and a genre there that they get a lot of local people coming to that festival and they're selling 12 13,000 tickets and you know it is adding a lot of value to the local area because the people are out and when you get people out of the off their seats and out of the houses they will spend money um bars restaurants and and everywhere else so you know it does work i see all these amazing statistics and all this amazing res research with tourism intelligence scotland and and i'm looking at it and i'm thinking Having heard what they're doing in the Shetlands, what happens in the Outer Hebrides, what's, what's happening really all around the country, um, where, why aren't there any stats related to music? Is that because I'm deluding myself and in my own bubble, I'm thinking maybe it's worth a lot more than it is compared to, say, something like uh, food tourism or whiskey tourism or... You know, any of the other areas where there is specific, there are specific reports, or there there is specific research carried out. Because we've 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 not. I mean, the only um, research around music tourism as standalone that I know is the one probably you, you know is UK music, UK music, UK one. music, and it. I, I mean, was it? 900 million into the UK for music alone. And it didn't really sample, it didn't sample 5, any of them under, under 5,000. Yeah. So that ruled out loads of these Scottish things that are really driving this, this growth in the festival sector in Scotland as well. So, yeah. I mean, things, what's 184% rise in festivals, festival revenues in Scotland in five years. And um, that's been driven by the, the small and medium-sized events. There's nothing specific there, Olaf. I mean, there's plenty anecdotal stuff around. And I know one of my colleagues said to me recently that when Morrissey was playing in Inverness, uh, a large percentage of their ticket sales came from international sales. I think. I mean, Les quoted me something from one of his concerts. It must have been one of your first half dozen concerts you said right we've it brought in what is a 1.2 or 1.4 million yeah uh, i mean w w we did uh roger and inverness it was a 1.4 1.5 million now to give you an idea we had a 19,454 people in the stadium in inverness the population of the city is 60,000 a third of the population of inverness was on a football pitch first time the stadium's ever had that many people in it but they were there um it you know those nineteen half thousand people then had to head in one direction or they could have went two directions they could have went over the bridge down the a9 or into the city center you couldn't move and it, you know it actually caused problems in terms of there was too much and that's unfortunate but what's but interesting is is that it's it's commonplace for these surveys to be done in scotland i mean robert hicks did one when he did the first ever loop -a -loo. And yeah, I'm, I'm wondering that here, when this is presented, it still doesn't seem to get you very far. I mean, I many years later, I'm still asking how, you know, if you've got someone going to uh, any of these events, how, ma how many more nights do they stay? What, where else do they go? And, and no one knows um, that this doesn't exist. And, and I wonder, you know, I think that you make a really interesting point because I know, the, how quickly, say, live music promoters work. Um, the DF Concerts, the biggest in Scotland, has, um, they organize the Edge Festival during the Fringe, but you never get the lineup in the Fringe program because it's only announced maybe a couple of months before, because that's how quickly that industry works. Where, and I wonder if there's a, a cultural difference. I've, I've gone to an agency and suggested doing a competition where all they had to do was sort out a couple of um, EasyJet flights and, um, and set up an email. And three weeks was, was not enough time to, to do that. Definitely a cultural difference. I mean, airlines, for example, now I've got the experience of working with Iceland there on, on developing uh, airwaves. When I started working for the festival and the airline in 2003, the biggest problem all the European offices for Iceland Air had that there was never a lineup announced until September and the festival was in October. 
And the airline people always said, we can't promote this. Now, there were a couple of things that I asked the promoter to do. One was to do some kind of announcements in May to help the airline, or just to kind of relax them a little bit. And then the second thing I did, I, was, I went to all the marketing people and I told them, we're not kind of about big headlines. We're about Iceland airwaves and making that an experience for people. And over the years, it actually uh, became irrelevant because Iceland Air now sells 1,000 packages to this festival. Out of a third of them, they sell before anything is announced. So people go to Iceland Airways because they trust that there will be a good lineup, and they're not kind of bothered because it's not about big headline <coughs> acts. But I think also the, the really kind of important thing here is that um, the dialogue somehow needs to develop between the different cultures and when you present these things, get them involved and, and make them, you know, that, so that they have a stake in this. How do you do course. that? Well, for example, with, um, with this survey that we've done for a couple of years, it's actually... One year we got the city council to fund it, the other year we got Promote Iceland to fund it, and we gave it to them and gave them the kind of, you know, you know we said, we will organize it, do it, but you fund it, but it's kind of your initiative. So really make it their initiative. How about that, Audrey? Uh, Tourism Intelligence Scotland, you fund me to go and take the initiative, but you can have it. Um, <laughs> you know, we can fill this information gap in the next few months. Um, how would we go about that? What, what, I, I maybe come at it from a different... What actually is it you want to achieve? Once you've got the information gap, what are you actually going to do with it? And how is that going to sort of... You know, for me, I'm really keen to understand perhaps what's holding, holding uh, development back. Is, is there something there where there is growth potential or visitors. Exactly. This is exactly okay. what happened with Promote Iceland. They saw a potential in knowing more about the behavior of the tourists that were coming. Yeah. And what would get them to spend an extra day in Iceland and what would get them to do extra activities in Iceland. So, of course, we gave them two or three of the 10 or 12 questions that were in the survey. Mm -hmm. And so they could measure what they needed to measure and then they can product develop something out of it. It's the added value point. You know, yeah. once you get the core product, or the core, in this case, is the, the music public, we have to add added value to it. And, you know, everybody who, who runs a business in any sector around a festival or music event should be looking at added value. Christine. Uh, can I give a good example? Because this is an example about music as well, probably not to everybody's liking. But uh, in Edinburgh, the tattoo... Yeah, is a big, big attraction in August. And they, I remember times, I've lived here for 40 years, I remember times when that was not always sold out. It is always sold out. And the way they have done it, they have it internationalized because this is possible now with the technology. And it is sold a trip to Edinburgh with two overnights, two ferries, with a coach from all over Germany, and it is usually full of uh, elderly people who don't want to die before they get uh, the chance to see the tattoo. They put <laughs> up with all this. They have one day going up to the Highlands or to the Perthshire Highlands, and the whole package costs something horrific, like 1,500 euro, okay? So that can all be booked because uh, usually in Germany, the agencies, the tourism agencies, will buy these packets with so and so many tickets in their own small regions where they can get enough people to come here on the coach. But I was going to say there's also something to this. Okay, infrastructure matters. And either you need hotels or you need people who are willing to open the doors. In, uh, at the D Festival in Faroe Islands, they do that in a little village and they open the doors and have camping spaces. But one of the things in Iceland that has been interesting over the last few years is that people are really kind of trying to see how they can do tourism 
throughout the year? What can they develop in terms of products or putting together what's there? And because if you're going to build hotels, you want to use them 12 months a year, not just mm -hmm. three months a year. And, uh, and one of the things that we've done as a music agency over there was to look at the schemes that the government is now uh, presenting and offer all the festivals our support and intelligence to look at how they can apply for these funds and develop products that are suitable for, um, it's called Iceland the whole year, outside the season tourism. So in, in fact, I kind of, it doesn't surprise me that the Edinburgh Festival is not particularly interested in, um, in music initiatives in that sense because it's full. You've got half a million people or whatever coming here for the month of August. You have to think outside the box and outside those kind of high season times if you want to bring in new initiatives, I think. I've, that's where the, that's where the I, I don't necessarily like that, but that's where the scope is for development, also for the music industry. I take on board your point about the hotels and stuff like that. One of the problems, obviously, in our area, and we, you know, so we do concerts across Scotland, but um, there's been two new hotels opened recently, and you know, all of a sudden they're fully booked. The problem we've got with outdoor events, we can't do them in September, October. We can't do them in July and August most of the time because it's going to rain or whatever. But the, you know, the problem is you can't put an event on in September or, or, or October because you're obviously relying. So, you so can we're going. A music hotel. Yeah, yeah. But we're going into the um, we're going into the market in a high season anyhow. So you know, whether it be the last weekend in August, the hotels are all going to be full. Potentially, they're all going to be full and stuff like that. So it, it, it's a difficult balancing act in terms of, uh, and we just don't have the indoor venues across Scotland to be able to. Davy, what, you were gonna, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to pick up on a point you made earlier there about musicians not really doing the, the research that's maybe necessary to back up what we do. Uh, that's very true, and I think it's a, it's a sort of, a, 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 it's not our kind of culture to, to do that, but it's great if you can get people to do it with you or on your behalf. But I think the problem that we have really, certainly I'll only speak about the Shetland Islands, but I'm sure it's endemic to most places, is actually getting what we'll loosely call politicians or the corporate world to take the music industry seriously as an industry. And that's one of the problems we certainly had in Shetland. I got some research done reluctantly by Shetland Islands Council in 2005 to show the value of music to Shetland as a, as a commodity, as, a, as an industry. And... Yeah, there's only 21,000 people there, so it's no sparkling figures, but they're pretty good in the context of 21,000 people, not all of whom spend money on music, let's be honest. There's some old people, some very young people, there's some people not interested in music at all. But anyway, what that research turned out was that the value of music to Shetland in a ring-fenced way was £2 million a year in direct income to those who are involved with the industry, either in a full-time way or part-time way, but the Shetland as a whole, the rest of the drivers, eating out, hiring taxis, buying clothes to go to, to, to events or whatever, was a value of £6 million a year. So £4 million was actually being generated by the music industry for the non-music industry in Shetland. And even then, when we proved those figures, and we tried to make them as conservative as we could, because knew, we knew the next thing that would happen was the politicians would try and disprove them, because they didn't actually see music as an industry as such. They saw it as a lovely social add-on. They saw it as a nice thing to push culturally, but they didn't see it as an industry, because the traditional industries were fishing, knitwear, or whatever. Music wasn't seen as an industry. And it was very difficult to get them to take even those figures seriously. Oh, they're not big enough. You know, but trying to put things into context, they're very interesting to hear what, what Les is saying about the figures they get in Inverness. I put on a concert in Lerwick and I sell, for instance, the Matt Cardell gig we did a few months back. I sold two and a half thousand tickets for two nights in a, in a small arena in, in Shetland. Now that's 10%, over 10% of the whole population of Shetland out on the town because of one person performing over two nights. And the amount of money that generates is a real... Uh, and a lot part of those of the people are is, coming is pretty, back to Shetland, major. right? So that's not how many of those are not not living in Shetland. All of those would have been in Shetland for whatever reason, either a visitor at the time. Nobody would have been probably coming. There might have been a handful that came in for the concert because it was a one-off. But he was playing Inverness as well, so I think it's unlikely. But getting them to take, getting 
Not so much HIE, I'll stick up for them. They're probably about the best supporters we have in, in terms of recognising uh, it as an industry. And I'm not saying that because Audrey is here, it's a genuine comment. But getting local authorities, getting anybody in sort of political circles to take music industry seriously in terms of what it brings is, is quite difficult, I feel, even I, when it generates big, big figures like, uh, like Les is mentioning. Well, I, I was just going to Audrey, yeah, can, I think this is... Uh... I, I was going to say that I think the tourism industry was up against that not that many years ago either. When the foot and mouth outbreak came about in 2001, um, the mantra at that time was tourism is everyone's business because um, the shop relied on the papers that mm -hmm. were supplying the hotel. Tradesmen were needed for the maintenance, the upkeep of the building, and supermarkets for... You, you know, it really, really made a huge dent. And I guess if there were other subsectors in here today that, you know, every, everybody wants to sort of lobby to sort of say, do you recognise the value that this particular sector brings in? And, <clears throat> and I, can, I can actually sympathise and, you know, I, I can understand. But you've just got to keep plugging away and eventually someone will actually say, yeah. I hear what you're saying and may take action. We, we, we had the exact same problem. Um, the venue we now use in Inverness, Northern Meeting Park, is a council-owned venue. It's, it's fantastic. It's got four walls, six gates. It's fantastic. What more can you ask for for a, an outdoor venue? We sat around in a panel with uh, the council, uh, three councillors. One councillor stood up in front of me and said, nobody likes Inverness because it's a city and these people will come anyhow, so you're not getting the venue. And that was the end of this discussion. We were not getting the venue. And we walked out, and I, I'm a taxpayer in that town. I thought that was disgraceful. We then went to the, uh, the provost as it is in Inverness and just turned around and said, thanks very much, but you don't want our business, and you don't, you know, it's, it, it's used for a cricket match, and they pay £38 a week. We're going to pay you X number of thousands for a week's hire. And 24 hours later, we had the venue. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there is that kind of thing. But on the defence of councils, um, nine months ago, we, we approached Glasgow City Council um, and we asked to uh, rent Bell Houston Park off them for a, a massive gig that we were looking at doing at the time. And um, unfortunately, the, 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 it never came through. And on the way out the door, they, they told us about something which was um, the Glasgow Show. I'd never heard of the Glasgow I don't know if anyone in here has ever heard of the Glasgow Show. It's been going since the air dot, supposedly. I never heard about it. But it's a family event that goes on every year over a Saturday and a Sunday and 40 to 45,000 people living in the Glasgow area go to. And he just turned around and said, by the way, we put on during the day Jedward and all those kind of people, but we have this stage and we have the sound and we have this and we have that. If you ever want to use it, give us a ring. And what they've now done is they've added value to their event. And this year, we have the Wet 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 reunion concert going on there. We have another concert there on the side tonight. So there is councils out there who are thinking, yeah, let's add value to the tourism. You know, whether it's not to do with music, they're using music as the add-on. And, you know, I think in some regions it does work, but, you know, we have the same kind of uh, problems. But I think the answer to it is you've just got to keep knocking the door yeah, and, and saying exactly. that. Exactly. Otter is right. And it's kind of, I think, to some degree, in all of the cultural and creative industries, uh, we need to maybe change our vocabulary a little bit for these people to understand what we're talking about. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about a lot is that everything that goes into us is funding. And I've consistently just uh, claimed that it's investment. And then based on that, created the statistics that show what this funding gives in return. And we did... Um, I you just, mean investment, yeah. Yeah, and it kind of, if you talk about investment, it's much easier for people to comprehend that it's something that gives something back, that it's not just money that disappears out there. And this was supported in Iceland. Um, I managed a, a survey that was done on all, the turnover from all of the creative industries. And the fact is, uh, contrary to popular belief, that there is no more contribution to creative industries than there is to, for example, aluminium plants or something else. The fact is, however, the turnover of creative industries in Iceland is the same as the aluminium plants. So if you just start talking about this is kind of, you got the 10, 12% investment, and this is what you get back in terms of jobs, in terms of taxes, in terms of all of these things. Little by little, you, it sinks in. Before we sort of finish, um, I think this is something that, 
I, I think it's a debate that really should be continued and it is something that should really be looked at. Um, the idea of this, um, this panel and a couple of the others that we've done is really to initiate that conversation. And although no one from the tourism sector uh, wanted, to, wanted to come um, other than Audrey, thanks. Uh, um, hopefully next year we'll get a handful of, um, handful of people that will be uh, will want to be in this audience and see how they can work with the the music sector because I don't think they're two different things. I think they're intertwined, and um, hopefully by knocking on some door, more doors, we'll we'll get to that stage. I'd like really like to thank um, our panelists. Um, they've all come from far away to be here today, and um, yeah, if you could give them a, a big round of applause, please.